I told you before, you're going to love it. And I tell you, you really are going to love it. We're kind of rebranding the property that's over there. Instead of calling it just the house or the lighthouse, the whole rebranding idea, it is the life center. And that means it's the, it's the whole property, and we want it to be a property of life. You know, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, I have come that they may have life, and that they would have life more what? abundantly and that's the vision that we see for that property and things over there God's got some special plans and ideas and a lot of those come through you and we want to say thank you you know right now we're we're having what we call a mid-morning shower on on June the 12th you see the display out there and the umbrellas like Joel said we're not asking for rain but there's different items that we can use in in that in that uh, life center and uh, some are out on the property, some are in the house. So if you have an opportunity, stop by, by the Home Point Center, pick up one of those little cards, make sure you, when you take that card, you put an initial on the master list so we know who it is that's responsible for that. And then you can bring it to the church if you can't make it on the 12th, or you can just bring it on, on June 12th, and we'll be having a mid-morning fellowship at the Life Center, not in the gym. So after church is over, I won't preach real long, and you can go over there, that's kind of hopefully, and then we'll go over there, and you can kind of get a tour, see some of the things that are in that place and some of the things that are needed, and then be in prayer uh, for what God has to do in, his, in this new you know, Life Center. We've been talking about life change, and we've been looking at the story of Jonah's life in, in the first three chapters, how God desires to change his life and is moving in that direction. And I know some of you may have, uh, you're just kind of grabbing on right now. And if you're just joining us right now, this, you want, may want to go back and uh, check our Facebook page or, or our website, and you can go back and pick up some of the, the sermons that before, because some of those things are just really powerful. We started this series back uh, in Resurrection Sunday, and we've been kind of moving along through this book. I don't know about you, but the whole story, message about Jonah has really changed in my life as I've gone through these couple weeks. Seeing it in a whole different manner and having understanding that God uses the same manner in changing Jonah's life, he uses it to change our life. He uses the idea of, of calling us and directing us and, and guiding us just like he has been th- through Jonah. And we started talking about how the same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that God desires to use in your life to change you. And we've been looking at some of the things that's happened here. And what we've noticed is that God shows up. Jonah's is life. God shows up again and again. Even though he makes mistakes, even though there's some heartache and difficulty, God shows up. And that's what's great about that is that I believe that God shows up in our life. Even though we go through trials and heartaches and difficulties, God still shows up. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that God uses to change our own lives. So God uses, like I said, in the same way. And just like in the, in the cycle with Jonah, God calls us, God directs us, God leads us to do something that naturally we would not do. God called Jonah to do something he would naturally do. And that brings about change. Here's the point. If you keep doing what you've always been doing, you're always going to be in the same place that you were. Sometimes God puts a call, a direction, a movement in our life, whether it's morally or vocationally or relationally, because sometimes we get it messed up. I'm not called like like, like to Nineveh. No, but God has put calling and direction, and he's been given, he's been helping you in your your life, moving you in a certain direction, and we can either embrace it, or some of us, like Jonah, we want to run from it. We want to flee from it. But whatever the case is, God is going to be steadfast and he's going to continue to desire to change us, to help us change in our life from the inside out. We understand as we're going through the, this message that um, Jonah, when he got the call from God to go do something he had never done before, and we're going to find out the real reason why in chapter 4, but what he did was he began to run away from God. And when you begin to run away from God, we put ourselves outside of God's will, opening ourselves up to a lot of difficulty, a lot of heartache. In Jonah's case, it was a, nat- it was a, it was a real storm. And in that storm, he, he, he was thrown overboard, thrown overboard in the water. And there, God now intervenes. He sends a big fish. God intervenes with grace to save Jonah's life, but also 
to wake him up, to get him to think differently. And inside the belly of the whale, Jonah comes to understand he needs to die to himself and he needs to let God reign. Let God rule. That's one of the big keys to life change. And instead of looking at myself, I need to die to myself and let God's spirit move. Let God's spirit reign. And that's what happened in the belly of the whale. And as he did that, he had what we called a metanoia experience. Now that's just a fancy Greek word for repent. But I like that word because metanoia means transformation. It means metamorphosis. It means the idea that I change my thoughts, I change my heart, I change my, not just my direction in which I walk, I change my thinking, my whole being. And, no, and Jonah has that in the belly of the whale. And then Jonah finds that God's call for his life as he gets out of that belly doesn't go away. God's call is still there. Even though there's been a lot of time, a lot of things has happened, the call of God in his life and the direction and the movement that he has in his life is still there. And when Jonah decides to answer that call, that direction, that leading, guess what happens? God shows up. And God shows up in a powerful and mighty way. And so Jonah goes to Nineveh. Actually, that's where the fish spit him out on anyway. And so he went and followed exactly what God asked him to do. And on the first day, we learned last week, on the first day, the people of Nineveh began to repent. And the king said, everybody needs to fast. We need to pray. Sit in sackcloth and ashes. And let's repent. And if we repent, if we have a metanoia experience, changing our heart, our soul, our minds, and our thinking, and our direction, maybe, maybe God will have mercy on us. And we know what happened. They repented. And their destruction did not come. And we can say, great, happy ending. Isn't it wonderful? But that was only chapter 3. You've got to look at chapter 4. Because, see, the Bible is very real. And, and, and Jonah is a very real person. And I want to tell you, like me, Jonah wasn't done messing up. And so we want to read here, God wasn't done working on him. God was still moving in his life. And we get the idea that, yay, the people repented. It's wonderful. But look what happens to Jonah. He says, Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. So now let's pick up in the fourth chapter of the book of Jonah, looking at verse 1. And this is what it says. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. The people repented. They met annoyed. They sought God. And Jonah became angry. So he prayed to God. And he said, A God? Lord, was this not was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, or I could say because, that's why I fled. Therefore, I fled previous to Tarsus. For I know that you are gracious and a merciful God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life. Take my life from me. For it's better for me to, to, to die than to live. I'll just stop right there. <laughs> Here's what comes out. Now we know why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Why he didn't want to follow God's way. He didn't want those people to be saved. He didn't want those people to repent. He knew if he went there and if they accepted the message of God, he knew that if they repented that God would save them. He knew that God's grace and God's mercy was abundant and would follow through. He knew that God's loving kindness and forgiveness would be able to be given to the whole city. And Jonah did not want that. That's why Jonah ran away in the first place. Now through this whole series, we've talked about the call of God coming into our life whether it's moral call or whether it's a vocational call or a relational call. But we have to understand there's things that God calls us to, He leads us and He brings us to, to change our life, to get us to do something that we wouldn't normally do, to live a way that God desires for us to live. Now here's the pushback. You and I have the same kind of pushback that Jonah does. We wrestle with, we don't always want to do it. Whatever the call is, the direction, the leading that God has for you in your life, 
many times we just say, God, I just don't really want to do it. We find out with Jonah that we reject God's call because, because of what God would do. I want to back up here. In God's call, His leading, His direction, His moving in your life, do you reject His call for what God may do in your life? That's a question only you can answer. Because see, Jonah knew. He knew if he told his people about God and they turned to God, that God would turn to them and save them. He knew that if they decided to change their life and change their thinking and change their ways, he knew that God would come alongside them and help them to change. And Jonah didn't want that. Many of us fight God's direction. We fight what God has in the future. Instead of letting God explode in our life, we fight it because of what he may do. It's interesting, you know, here, here's Jonah who's a prophet of God. And he's a God's messenger. And he's to preach the word of God to these people. And he didn't want them to be saved. He, he, he didn't want them to repent. And he can say, man, how crazy is that? Well, the only problem is it's still crazy today. It's still crazy in our own world today. Particularly, craziness comes from religious people who do not want to share the gospel with others. Let me just give you a couple of examples here. A gentleman by the name of Fred Craddock tells this story. He says, I used to be the pastor of the First Church of Christ in East Tennessee near Oak Ridge. It was a small church that had been there 112 years. A very small community until... A huge factory was built where materials were made for a, some kind of nuclear project was being developed. And so this sleepy town, this sleepy old church, people start coming from all over the place, putting up RVs and tents and putting up different shelters and living just so they could work there. Well, the preacher, Fred, thought how wonderful it would be to begin to reach out to all those people, to reach out to those, those just moving into the area. What a wonderful opportunity God has put around them. And so he planned and told the church leaders how he was going to start an evangelistic program with them. Well, the church leader says, oh, wait a minute. How do we know what these people are like? Maybe these people aren't like ours. I mean, they, they don't even have property. They don't even live here. And, and they, they seem a lot different than we are. I'm not so sure that's a good idea. So they decided to have a congregational meeting. The next Sunday, they'd have a congregational meeting talking about whether they would evangelize or not. Did you hear what I just said? They're going to have a congregational meeting to decide whether they were going to evangelize or not. And so in this congregational meeting, First thing that happened was somebody stood up and made a motion. And the motion was that um, no one could be a part of the church unless they had property in the county. Someone else seconded it. It was voted and passed, and that was it. So no evangelizing all those people. Well, it wasn't too long before Fred had left the church and Several years later, he, he kind of wanted to go back just to see what had happened there. And so he went back to this painful memory and found the church building, but it was really different. In the parking lot, there were RVs and vans and motorcycles and trailers, and he noticed a sign out front by the church that said, Barbecue, all you can eat. The church had died and become a restaurant. And Fred, turning to his wife, said, it's a good thing this still is in the church or all these people wouldn't be able to even eat in there. And now, that, that was kind of a blatant thing, but, you know, that sometimes we have even our own churches. We have this own Jonah spirit. You know, as I think about this, I remember traveling for the college uh, for Great Lakes, and I can think of several experiences like this. And let me just share Two personal ones, and, and, and one of them, there's a church in the, in the Atlanta area, and a church of about 250, 300 people, an affluent, affluent community. They had a beautiful building, had a great 
large gym with a kitchen off to the side. And they, they even had some property right next to the church, that almost two acres that someone had donated to the church. The minister had been there 10 years, was just thrilled, excited about this new property, excited about the building that was there and the future they had. But the community in that area was changing. A lot of Me- Mexican-Americans and African-Americans were coming to, this, to, the, to the community. The minister thought, what a wonderful opportunity to reach out to the American, Mexican-American families, but he found resistance in the church leadership. And so he decided to have a special service just for them. So after the morning service was over, they would have a Mexican-American service, some in English and some in Spanish afterwards, in order to meet the needs of the Mexican-Americans that were there that had a hunger for God's word. But as time went on, more and more African-American people started coming to the morning worship, to their services. And it wasn't too long before the leadership said, you know, they need to get their own church. We're not so sure we want their children in with our Sunday school children. Matter of fact, I'm not so sure their teenagers should have this be a part of the same youth group that we have. And definitely, we're not going to change our worship service. We're not going to sing anything different. We're not going to have anything else happen in here because everything we've done has been fine for us for years. Well, the preacher challenged them to grow and to change because the gospel is for everybody. Well, the church leadership, they fixed the problem. They fired the minister. And they said, because he wasn't taking care of his own. Another church that was started back in, 19, in the 1940s, a small congregation in western Pennsylvania, decided they wanted to grow and be a part of a, of a, di- a different community. So they built a new church not too far away from a growing, from a growing community. And they're a small church of about seven, 70 people. But the problem that they had was they were so narrow, so legalistic in, in the word of God not allowing God's spirit to move or spirit to work, that if you didn't do church, you didn't dress the way you were supposed to dress, if you didn't have the right kind of language, if you didn't do church just the way they thought it should be done, you weren't very accepted. Now, they were friendly and very welcoming. But if you didn't believe exactly as they believed or the way the order of the church should be, and matter of fact, you better not move that communion table. It wasn't too long before the church began to die out. I visited that church several years ago and because I knew the minister that had been there was in the area and went back to visit the church. I, the minister no longer was there and I found the church was now an apartment building. These kind of things, they disturb me. But you know, it makes me look inside myself and it makes me look at our own body and our own culture. And what I see in our body and in the culture of churches around us is a real meism. It's about me. It's about me. It's about mine. It's about what I want, what I believe I need. Some people call it a spirit of narcissism. You know what I'm talking about. You think about being narcissistic, you know. In the Greek, in Greek mythology, narcissism, the narcissist, would walk by and he saw his face in the, in the pool of water and was so enamored by his face that he just stayed right there and just enjoyed who he was. And so some of the people call it a narcissistic spirit. I, I tend to think of it as, as really meism. It's all about me, all about my mentally. So everything that happens in the worship time is to fulfill my concerns, is to meet my needs. How many times do we hear people say, well, I'm not fed. I don't feel fed today. I don't feel fed at that place. Instead of saying, you know, boy, I need to be taught how to feed other people. I'm not ministered at that church anymore. Instead of discovering how I can minister to others. I don't get anything out of worship. I don't get anything out of the sermon. As if the whole idea of being together was for their edification rather than for the edification of God. Meism has has really moved into the idea of a consumer mindset. Church becomes a place of a filling station where our needs are met. And if our needs aren't met there, well, then maybe we need to go somewhere else where it's more entertaining or where my needs can be met in a better way. And all that comes from people who believe when their Savior says, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve others and be a ransom for many. The the people that think these things and act this way, all have a Savior who says, whoever wants to be great among you must be servant of all. 
And in Jesus' last and dying breath, he says, not my will, but yours be done. Yes, the spirit of meism has really infected the church, even to the point at which that we spend more time with believers and bringing believers into our body than we spend time with those that, like Nineveh, that don't know their right hand from their left hand when it comes to spiritual things. Missions is great, and it's wonderful, and we support missions, and that's beautiful. And sometimes we go on mission trips, but why do we spend so much time, energy, and money just on feeding people who are already spiritually overweight? Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 9. Jesus said this in verse 12. It says, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. He was talking to the religious leaders, the Pharisees. He says, I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. We all need Jesus, that's true. We all have spiritual needs that God desires to fill. But there's a lot of lost and dying people in our own community, in our own neighborhoods, lost and dying people in our own job markets where we work. And sometimes we still think it's all about me. It's about I, what I can receive from the church. It's about what my family c- can get. And why do we turn so inward when the focus that God has us is to b- turn outward? You know, it's, it's really a spirit of meism. You can call it a Jonah's spirit if you wish. It's spirit that doesn't want to reach out because of what it may take to reach out to the lost. You see, it's one thing to say, we, in, 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 to, in theory, it's great, but in practice, it's hard. Because in practice, it takes self-sacrifice. In practice, it takes, it takes change. Sometimes I hear these kind of things from church attenders and from other pastors. And, they, and we say, of course I want to reach out to the community. But I'm not going to change how the worship service goes. I'm not going to change how we sing or the kind of songs that we sing. Yes, I want to reach out into the community. But, you know, we've always been a church of 200. We've been a church of 200 before. And now we're a church of 200 again. So it's never going to change. Yes, I want to reach out to the community. But I'm not interested in doing anything different in reaching out. I'm not sure what it's going to cost us. I don't know if I want those kind of people in our building. I'm not going to change how I preach just to reach the lost. Hey, what do you mean? We've got to turn over. I'm not going to turn over the church to some 20-something people. Well, I'm going to tell you they're 30 now. (laughs) And they have a lot of good ideas and plans. And we can't just sit back. This goes on and on. The problem with reaching out today is it calls for sacrifice and it calls for inconvenience. The Jonah spirit, the spirit of meism lives on because we're really not interested in having our life change. I wonder what God said to Jonah. I mean, God could have come down real hard on him, and he would have deserved it. But I want you to look at, at chapter 4. Look what God says, because, you know, God has showed up in unbelievable ways. God showed up with mercy and compassion. It was God's heart. It was God was after Jonah's heart. Look what he says in verse 4. Verse 4, chapter 4. First sentence is kind of sarcastic. Have you any right to be angry? Question mark. Jonah went out and sat under a place east of the city. And there he made a shelter and sat in the shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. And when the Lord provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give him shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day God provided a worm and he chewed the vine so that it withered. Then the sun rose up, and God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head, so he grew faint. He wanted to die. 
and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But then God said to Jonah, do you have any right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I'm angry, angry enough to die. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about the vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight, and it died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who do not know their left hand from their right. Should I not be concerned about that great city? Did you catch that? It's pretty simple. Jonah was concerned about the vine. He was concerned about his comfort. He was concerned about what the vine had brought to him and the happiness. And, and if it was going to be gone, I'd rather die. See, for Jonah, the vine was everything. For Jonah, the vine was comfort that met his needs, is a sense of well-being. And if I were to put it in a different framework, and please don't take offense here, but if I put in a different framework, Jonah was concerned about his salary level, the square footage of his house, his furniture, his car, his vacation, whether there was air conditioning, those are the things that matter to him in life. And God said, you didn't put the vine there. You didn't have to worry about it when it was taken away. You cared so much about the vine. Don't you think I care about the 120,000 people in that city? Now, not many people are going to leave here this morning and say, hey, great sermon preacher. Because this kind of hits home with me. It becomes personal when I begin to think about it. Caring about the men and women and the children that are just in our neighborhood. Or do I care too much about the vines? I care more about what comfort I have, what things are about me. <laughs> Look in that opening line in, in, in Jonah 4.4. 4. He says, have you any right to be angry? God says, I am God. I can do what I desire to do. I can bring healing or I can take it away. I can bring a vine or I can take it away. I can give mercy. And by the way, I've given mercy and I've given grace to the people of Nineveh just like I've given grace and mercy to you. How dare you not fall all over yourself and give mercy to others when I've freely given you so mercy. And the final lesson of this book is in the last line of the, of the last verse where God says, should I not be concerned? We're never told how Jonah responds. We're not told about the change in his heart, but we are. We have, uh, God has revealed his heart. God says to us, the people that are around us are lost. They're alone. They're hurting. They're self-medicating. They're cutting. They're filling their minds with pornography. They're having affairs. They're lost, and they need me. The final lesson for life change is this. Having your heart being broken with the same things that break God's heart. If we're really interested and want to experience life change, we need to allow the things that break God's heart to break our heart. And when we do, life change happens. God reveals his heart to us and make no mistake, his heart beats for holiness, his heart beats for justice, his heart beats for those people that are far from him. God, if we really look at it, is a lovesick father wanting all of his children to come home. When I think about this term, God being a lovesick father, and I think about this idea of his heart and how my heart needs to break with the same things that breaks his heart, I can't help but think of the story of the prodigal son. How, how the father just stood out there waiting day after day for, for, the, lost to, for the lost son to come back. That's how God is for us. And maybe you're here this morning and you've been living in Nineveh for a long time. And you don't realize how much God cares about you, how much God loves you, how much God wants to receive you unto himself. God is a lovesick father and his desire is for you to come home. And maybe that's you this morning. 
And so we offer that invitation to you. You don't have to live in Nineveh anymore. You, all you need to understand is how much God cares about you. And then there's, a, there's the rest of us here. And the rest of us here who we have to understand that are you waiting? What is it in your life that God's leading you to, directing to you, causing you to move to that you do not want to do? Why are we ignoring the fact that God desires to explode into our life? He wants to show up in us as we follow his heart. God is really a lovesick father. So maybe too many of us were sitting under the vine and we're enjoying all the comforts and the things that God brings to us. We really, we need to allow what breaks God's heart to break our own. If we're really interested in change and experience life change, that's where it starts. Maybe you and I need to repent of our heart's condition. Maybe we need to, to ask God to help us because we've been sitting under the vine too long. That means we need to take time to pray. We're going to end the service this morning, we're end the, the preaching this morning. Were you having an opportunity to pray to God? In other words, I'm going to ask you just to bow your heads and in silence, in your own solitude, you let God's Spirit speak to your heart. So why don't you do that right now? Just close your eyes. Block out everyone that's around you. Allow God's Spirit to speak to your heart regarding your heart's condition, regarding where you sit, regarding the call direction and leading he has on your life because God says shouldn't I be concerned about all those so pray and seek the Lord now come and close out the service. I think there's a lot of different ways that we can respond to a sermon like that. And for me personally, um, a sermon like that doesn't really have a here I go response, but it has a, a response that, that starts in my heart. A response that, that starts in my heart and works with my mind to eventually come out in my hands. And so my prayer for you today is that over the next few days, uh, you'll spend some time thinking, thinking about what was said here, maybe re-listening to the sermon again, uh, taking some notes, jotting things down, allowing God to really infect and be a part of and change your heart. And I want to encourage you on Thursday, uh, we'll have, I put out a, a video every Thursday or Friday, we, we shoot for Thursday, but every Thursday we put out a video kind of recapping and reconnecting with some stuff that happened in church on Sunday. And I want to encourage you that on Thursday to check it out. Uh, we'll make sure an email goes out to remind people. Uh, but but the God's been doing a few things on this part with our youth. And so I, I'm going to be praying and seeking, okay, God, how do you want me to show what our youth are learning uh, and connect with what Ron was talking about today? Um, but I believe that the change starts in our heart. And so we can't just walk out of this building and let it go to waste. So let me pray for you, and then, uh, then you'll be dismissed, and you can head down to the, to the gym for some fellowship time, and maybe there's something here that you need to, to share with someone there, or maybe you need to stick around for a few minutes and, and pray with someone. Uh, we've got people in the back who are willing to pray with you. Uh, but let me pray with you right now, and, and we'll close out this service. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you for the message, Lord, the, the message to us that we can't be afraid to do what you've called us to do, and we have to stop being angry when you do things that are outside of what we want because maybe there's other people that need to be a part of your kingdom that we are hindering. 
And so, Lord, as we walk out today, I pray that you will continue to tug at the heartstrings of our life and that you will continue to connect those, those emotions with, with the things that we know in our brain so that things can come out in our hands for action to take place. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great day.